Welcome to the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire Conquered Black Heritage Tour. I'm Bob Thompson, president of the board of the trail, and I'm joined by Senator David Waters, a fellow board member. This tour forms part of the Black Heritage Trail's plan to expand the trail statewide from Portsmouth to include communities throughout the state. African American history is New Hampshire history, and this is especially true in this, our capital city. From its colonial founding as Pinnacook, renamed Rumford, and then conquered in 1765, black people have been integral to its life. We will visit sites associated with enslaved persons, free persons of color, and the interconnections of African Americans and indigenous people. We will learn some names, Dinah, Pompey, Caesar, Salem, Nancy, and Lucy, among many others whose histories are not known. We'll meet Revolutionary War soldiers, anti-slavery champions, including Frederick Douglass, and escaped enslaved people on the Underground Railroad. We'll see extraordinary historical objects, visit a graveyard and a pauper cemetery, reminders that making black lives matter must liberate our understanding of history from the shackles of white narrative. We will include sites associated with more recent history, including a famous artist and one contemporary political leader. This tour is just the beginning of rediscovery of Concord's black heritage. We begin at the house of the Reverend Timothy Walker. This neighborhood was the center of early Concord settlement with the meeting house, a defensive garrison, a store, and a meeting place for the state legislature in the new capital in 1782, home to tradespeople and farms on the rich planting lands along the Merrimack River and the Oxbow. It was also the center of black history, since slavery was essential to the success of these early settlers. As in other communities, the minister's house was a slave quarters. The Reverend Walker's house was built in 1733, and a garrison fortification for the surrounding families was added in 1739. Hard construction work, farming, oxen driving, household chores, and cooking were taken on by Walker's slaves, Prince, Violet, and Lucy, as well as persons enslaved by his neighbors. This house is also notable as it is in 1782, and the building now across the street, which then stood next to the Walker House, were the site of the first session of the state legislature in the new capital city of Concord. This legislature and its Revolutionary War and colonial predecessors enacted and enforced the enslavement of Africans and Native Americans, and later, the subjugation of free people of color. Just three years earlier, the legislature had tabled the petition for freedom submitted by enslaved men in Portsmouth. In 1782, the legislature met in the hall over Walker's store. The president of the state and council melt in his house's north parlor. The south parlor served as a general committee room, and the room above it was the office of the treasurer. These were busy days for Prince, Luce, and Violet to wait on the men who denied that the revolutionary ideal that all men are created equal with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness applied to enslaved persons. Systemic racism is interwoven in the very fabric of the founding of the state of New Hampshire. As a state senator, I know governments keep records, so we can recover some historical facts the earlier white historians and politicians reconfigured into a false narrative of freedom. The census of 1767 listed nine male slaves and four female slaves in Concord. In 1790, four enslaved persons and several emancipated other free persons. In 1810, 10 other free persons. But a young woman was enslaved in New Hampshire as late 
as the 1840 census, and the state did not abolish slavery until 1857. This record belies early historians who claimed that the New Hampshire Constitution of 1783 effectively abolished slavery. New Hampshire's earliest historians often included anecdotes about enslaved persons, usually in relation to the family histories or genealogies of their enslavers, as part of what Orlando Patterson called the social death of slavery. Jeremy Belknap, New Hampshire's first historian, claimed slavery was humane and their labor not more severe than that of white people. Historian Lyford notes the slaves of Concord were few and the masters merciful. This incident and others just cited tend to show what involuntary servitude was in Concord and attest that though it was slavery, it was not oppression. Many enslaved people are known only by bills of sale for this human chattel property. In 1761, Hannah Bowers was sold unto Lot Colby of Rumford, a mulatto boy named Salem for 45 shillings. Andrew McMillan purchased an eight-year-old Negro girl, Dinah, and in 1767 purchased an 11-year-old boy, Caesar. We know Dinah later moved to Canterbury and more than 100 years later, her descendants were still selling baskets in Concord. As in Portsmouth and Exeter, the worthiest men of the parish were masters of slaves. Benjamin Rolfe, Abraham Stanley, the Reverend Timothy Walker, Andrew McMillan, Lot Colby, and others. There are indications of rape, as Captain John Roach's Negro woman had a child who later was taken care of and supported by the town, or Deacon Joseph Hall, whose female slave had two children. Resistance to this unpaid labor of slavery is revealed in the story of one of these children, John, who was declared non compos mentis because he caused trouble, skipping every other hill when hoeing potatoes, and he said, so as to keep up or feigning such an inability to unyoke calves that a hired man put the yoke on John. Coroner Stevens made his enslaved man the meeting house dog whipper, but he earned pennies by amusing children during services and sermons by chasing and whipping dogs around the pews. In another trickster tale, an enslaved boy, Caesar, tricked a free man of color, Florence McCauley, who served in the Revolution and then worked for Colonel McMillan, who prided himself on his marksmanship, but he was tricked into shooting dead his master's prized horse. Caesar fled after this incident and wandered wherever he could get employment. This is the slave legacy of early Concord. The interwoven histories of Native Americans and African Americans included frontier kidnapping and warfare. Abnakis, who never conceded white possession of lands in Concord and northwards, especially valuable corn planting grounds, saw a kidnapping of enslaved people as just compensation to sell at the Dutch trading post at Schenectady. During the French and Indian Wars, parties of Abnakis and Penacooks launched attacks, including in Concord on August 11, 1746. When Lieutenant Jonathan Bradley and Samuel Bradley and three others were killed, the stripped and disfigured bodies, Samuel Bradley's head cut almost to pieces, were loaded into a cart and then taken down Main Street, where a multitude gathered and mothers lifted up their young children to see the dead bodies in the cart. Bradley's three-year-old son, John, was shown the bloody bodies of the slain 
as they lay together at Osgood's garrison and retain through life a lively impression of the scene. Indeed, the impression was so strong that a terror of the Indians haunted him for many years afterward. And his grandfather Abraham's faithful servant, Pompey, whom had been purchased for 30 bushels of corn, used to accompany him as a sort of lifeguard and to carry him when quite a large boy on his back. The next day, all were buried here. Now, Pomp was willed to John by Abraham, but perhaps aware of the potentially abusive and dependent relationship with John, he ordered that the executor take especial care that my said Negro be not wronged by my aforesaid grandson in any ways. And if he should wrong him, I give him power to do him justice. And he gave Pompey the use of a half of an acre of land next to his house. In 1837, John Bradley's son and others commissioned a monument for the skirmish site. And Concord celebrated with sermons, poems, and songs. It's an example of whitewashing and redwashing the violence of slavery by defining colonial history as white victimization by native peoples. And the story of Pompey creates an image of black docility, faithfulness, and allegiance to whites as an affirmation of white racial innocence. The New Hampshire Historical Society is an essential stop on the Concord Black Heritage Tour since it is the repository of so many documents and artifacts of African American history from Concord and across the state. The Society has taken the lead in recovering black history through its publications, including the special issue of Historical New Hampshire, Too Long in the Shadows. David served as trustee of the Society, and with me welcomes a partnership between the New Hampshire Historical Society and the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. We're joined by curator Wes Bala, who has brought together some extraordinary items to give voice to black lives and aid in the retelling of New Hampshire history through these voices and lives. Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, married Sarah Walker Rolfe in 1769, the daughter of the Reverend Walker and the wealthy widow of Benjamin Rolfe. Their daughter, Sarah, was born on October 18, 1774, and her father, suspected of aiding the British troops occupying Boston, fled Concord in 1775, and he went on to lead a distinguished career in England and Europe as a diplomat and a famed scientist. Sarah became Countess Rumford and left substantial legacies when she died after her return to Concord in 1845, including founding the Rolf and Rumford Asylum. This painting, Benjamin Thompson's Farewell of 1850, depicts Benjamin Thompson, later Count Rumford, saying goodbye to his wife, Sarah Walker Rolf Thompson, in 1775 before leaving for England. Their daughter, Sarah, later Countess Rumford, is shown in the arms of the Thompson slave, Dinah. The inscription by Sarah on the back of the painting reads, this of my father taking leave of my mother, leaving me an infant in the arms of favorite slave Dinah. I give as a mark of friendship to my cousin, Mr. Joseph B. Walker, Esquire. So it depicts Sarah in the arms of Dinah, a slave given to her mother by her father-in-law, Abraham Rolfe. The painting is a telling 
revisioning of her family history, of conquered history, and American history. It was painted in 1850, the year of the detested compromise by Daniel Webster, with its fugitive slave law that brought slave catchers to New Hampshire. And it showed the lie to such happy fantasies of slavery and the founding of the Republic. It presents a marriage and a child about to be abandoned by a man who was considered a traitor to the American cause and imagined an enslaved woman as a loving accomplice to an imagined past. Dinah's childhood sail away from her mother is erased in the sentimental focus on the white child. Black lives didn't matter in 1775. So the story of the Walker Rolf Thompson families has to be recentered around the life of Dinah and others enslaved in early Concord. Perhaps Sarah, with her requests for the poor, imagined a society that could care for its most vulnerable citizens. But black clouds were gathering over the nation in the 1850s. Upon its completion in 1819, the State House joined the old townhouse and the old meeting house grounds as sites of civic ritual and celebration. African Americans were important actors in this civic life, often challenging the political and racial order. A great example is the case of Samson Battis of Canterbury. His life shows the interwoven conquered histories of African Americans and indigenous peoples. Colonial authorities justified enslavement of Native Americans taken in warfare, the most infamous example being the dozens tricked into captivity in Dover in 1676 and sold into slavery in the Caribbean. Because if sold into slavery in New Hampshire, these Native Americans could easily escape. When the practice was outlawed, some in New Hampshire turned to enslaving Caribbean Taino peoples. William Coffin of Concord enslaved Lucy, a West Indian Indian. Samson Battis wanted to marry her, and he worked for Coffin for a year to purchase her out of slavery and they married and lived in Canterbury. Battis himself may have had mixed African-American and Native American ancestry, because when freed after the service in the American Revolution, he shucked off his enslaver's name of Moore and renamed himself Battis, a shortening of a popular Abnaki name, St. Baptiste. His story in Canterbury is told elsewhere, but his presence in Concord was notable for his participation in Election Day events annually in June. Battis was famed as a fiddler. As part of the governor's color guard, though, he served for decades leading the procession from the Reverend Walker House in earlier years to the parade grounds near the old North Meeting House and after 1819, to the State House grounds here. His and Lucy's daughter, Lucinda, or Lucy, married another Revolutionary War veteran, Anthony Clark, a Warner musician and craftsman. At elections and musters, probably joining with Samson, they pitched a tent here, conducted dances, played music, and sold gingerbread. Another participation in these festivities was Prince, emancipated by the Reverend Walker in 1783. He moved to Andover, but he returned to Concord, dressed in a red coat, which he displayed with pride, saying, I rides in the troop, I do. Such insistence on highly visible appearances, especially in military uniform, demanded recognition as free citizens who threw off oppression in a time when white New Hampshire was intent on erasing slavery in its past and denying black access to education and employment.
This circa 1825 extraordinary portrait of Nancy Herbert is the only known image of a person enslaved in New Hampshire. It is a testament to an extraordinary woman who negotiated enslaved and free black and white identities and conquered. It is attributed to John M. Crowley. She is wearing a dress with high waist and full sleeves with lace fichu around shoulders. Her hair is pulled back in a curly bun with a large comb. On the back is the inscription, mulatto, slave woman, and the Herbert family, given freedom, but stayed in family. We learn from the image new information about her mixed racial heritage self, her self-presentation under the gaze of white people, and the ways in which she had made her presence known as a living testimony to the history of enslavement in Concord. Nancy Herbert was born in Boston in 1766 and sold at the age of 18 months to Lieutenant Richard Herbert for $5. As Booton's History of Concord tells the story, with the other children in the family, she learned to read and recite catechism. She used to say she was treated just the same as the older children, but suppose she did not expect so much. And also that she was never conscious of a wish that she had been born white. Nancy carefully negotiated freedom and enslavement, attempting to assert herself as a black woman and as what would come to be called a race woman in the 19th century, while also aspiring to recognition of a sort in a family, a church, and a community. One example of the excruciating ambiguity of her position was when she was about 15 and the state constitution was adopted. And she feared that she would be sent back to Boston, warned out of Concord to return to the place of her birth as an indigent. When she heard she was free, she burst into tears and exclaimed, what will become of me? They said that she should remain in her old and only home, where she remained until her death at age 79. An arrangement was made for compensation for her labor for the first time, and she received bequests by Mrs. Herbert for her care. She joined the church in 1816 and honored her profession, faithful, affectionate, and cheerful, with a strong memory to tell stories of her early life and enslavement to children. Here, she ensured the knowledge and acknowledgement of enslavement would be known by another generation at a time when rising anti-slavery agitation came to Concord. She read much, usually the Bible. In her charities, it said that she showed a particular interest in the education society, in the cause of missions, and in all efforts for the elevation of her race. She was a member of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society, and she probably met Frederick Douglass on his 1842 visit. She became disabled and died on October 9, 1845. An epitaph written by Benjamin Gleason, Esquire of Charleston, Massachusetts, arrived too late for the inscription on her original gravestone. But when the original stone was broken to pieces, a new marker included that epitaph. At first unknown, then sold a slave, then free and loved from early youth, in Christian hope ripe for the grave. This tablet but records her worth. Concord was a stop on the Underground Railroad where self-emancipated enslaved people could hide out until passage to Canada was secured. With Daniel Webster's capitulation 
to an enhanced fugitive slave law in the Compromise of 1850, and with the election of anti-abolitionist President Franklin Pierce, who infamously signed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, which inexorably led to the Civil War, slave hunting escalated in New Hampshire. Influenced by Quakers, Nathaniel White and his wife Armenia were anti-slavery advocates and social reformers. They established their farm near this one on Clinton Street and Concord as a stop for runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad. Slaves escaping from the South received food and clothing and rested for several days, hiding in an attic, a haystack, or in a barn until it was safe to move north to Canada and freedom. In one case, an unnamed escaped slave who remained at the farm for several days in 1857 made a dollhouse depicting a slave cabin for Nathaniel and Armenia White's daughter, Anna Francis. She was born in 1852 and died in 1865. As a note on the dollhouse written by a family descendant reads, this cabin was made by an escaped slave who went to my grandmother's house on Capitol Street in Concord. She sent him to the white farm on Clinton Street and he waited there with other escapees until the next guide came through to conduct them towards Canada. Thus was the time wild away. This slave cabin dollhouse is one of the only objects known crafted by an escaped enslaved man in passage on the Underground Railroad. It was made in 1857 for Anna Frances White, who lived from 1852 to 1865, of Concord, New Hampshire, by an unidentified escaped slave traveling on the Underground Railroad. From the outside, a child might imagine it as a typical slave cabin, but it is rich with racial ironies about slavery north and south. Harriet Wilson wrote in her book, Our Nig, about her experiences in a two-story, quote, White House North, showing that the shadows of slavery fall even there. Inside this house, North, enslaved people become dolls, playthings, an uncomfortable reminder of the agency of whites and the vulnerability of escaped black people. Behind the front panel, two African-American figures sitting on chairs in a room furnished with table, stool, cupboard, mug, and candlestick on fireplace mantel, a wall clock, a wall mirror, two landscape paintings, an oval hooked rug, and a cat. It transgresses racial and class boundaries by showing a black couple at home in such a house and invites a child to imagine such a life for black people safely as playthings. It challenges New Hampshire today to consider how race defines who claims New Hampshire as home. Frederick Douglass knew New Hampshire well. He tried to take a train from Boston to address the Dover Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1841 but when he was told to leave the passenger coach, he held so tightly to the seat that it and he were thrown onto the platform. On February 24th, 1844, in the old town hall, he gave a masterly and impressive speech in Concord and was described as being like Toussaint among the plantations of Haiti. He was an insurgent slave taking hold of the right of speech and charging on his tyrants the bondage of his race. Douglas worked in the abolitionist movement with Concord's Abby Kelly Foster and Stephen Foster, and the editor of the Herald of Freedom, 
Nathaniel Peabody Rogers. Douglas said, I was a slave even here in New Hampshire. When John Parker Hale became an anti-slavery advocate in New Hampshire, creating an epic battle against the anti-anti-slavery forces led by Franklin Pierce, Douglas made common cause with him. The Democrats kicked Hale out of Congress when he wouldn't support Texas annexation, and he then agitated and conquered and debated Pierce to turn voters for abolition. Hale became the first anti-slavery senator in 1847. Douglas gave a crucial endorsement for Hale's selection to run for president of the Free Soil Party ticket against Democrat Franklin Pierce. When the John Parker Hale statue was erected in 1892, an aged and seriously ill Frederick Douglass traveled to Concord for the unveiling. He began his remarks, I have made no preparation to address this audience and had hoped that the managers of this occasion would allow me to sit here and only give color to the occasion. Very feeble and suffering from a recent attack of ill health, he rose to the occasion to celebrate his friend and to castigate the Republican Party about current efforts to disenfranchise black voters. He says, I wanted to be here because I am one of the vast multitude of emancipated ones whom John P. Hale devoted his heart and transcendent abilities to liberate. He noted Hale's courage in contrast to the destruction of Noyes Academy in Enfield. At a time when honest farmers of New Hampshire thought themselves justified in yoking up 90 oxen to drag away a Negro schoolhouse, you will see that John P. Hale had something to meet in the state of New Hampshire as well as in the state of South Carolina. He believed the Senate needed a now another Hale. He decries violence against black people sweeping America. Until we infuse a little more backbone into the Republican Party, and that party will bring to the front the question of right, the question of justice, the question of the Constitution, we shall see this tide of violence sweep on. He calls on Republicans to denounce those who can stand up now on the floor of the Senate of the United States and tell the North, tell the world, that they mean to violate the Constitution so far as preventing the Negro voting. Then, as now, these words echo off the walls of the State House as a call to action. In Colonial, New Hampshire, the poor and the mentally ill were cared for by the town, which held an annual poor auction in which the lowest bidder for the cost of feeding, housing, and clothing the poor won. Elderly and infirm enslaved persons were supposed to be cared for by the enslaving family, but if they were emancipated so the family wouldn't have to pay, or otherwise free persons of color, they could be warned out or expelled from town because they were not native to the location or didn't, as people of color, have rights of residence. When counties established poor farms and the state of New Hampshire established the Asylum for the Insane in 1842, towns could send impoverished people of color to them and often they would classify them as mentally ill or insane to send them to the state's care in Concord. Harriet Wilson, the famous Milford African-American novelist, suffered the fate of being sent in ill health to the poor farm, and it's where her son died. Fear of being worn out is probably what frightened Nancy Herbert upon emancipation because she was indigent and a native of Boston. The annual reports of the asylum enumerate the people of color, predominantly African-American, but some 
Native Americans, broken by poverty, violence, or alcohol. It's one reason why we lose the names of Concord's African Americans, since their names and histories were finally erased with a shovel of dirt in a pauper's grave. As Mel Bolden would say, what's shaken? Well, Mel is still shaken in Concord, New Hampshire. Mel Bolden lived from 1919 to the year 2000. He was a famed illustrator and a painter. He was a friend of Norman Rockwell and was considered the dean of African-American illustrators. He moved to New Hampshire in the late 1950s, becoming involved in democratic politics and befriending the Concord Fire Department. In the 1960s, he was elected party chairman for Merrimack County, the only black county chairman in the country. He served on the State Commission for Human Rights. In his work for the Concord Monitor, he was known for his humorous illustrations to a guide to the New Hampshire presidential primary. His poster celebrating Krista McAuliffe's selection as the first teacher in space showed her in her Concord classroom. And after the tragic explosion of the space shuttle Challenger in 1986, he worked closely with Grace Corrigan for the commemorative Reach for the Stars mural at Framingham State University. In Concord, Mel is perhaps best remembered for his close relationship with Concord firefighters. He frequently dropped in at the stations and often used his friends as models for illustrations on various themes. He did four covers in 1977 for the centennial of Fire Engineering Magazine, one of which depicted a New Hampshire winter mutual aid response featuring Concord's pumper engine number one and a mutual aid response vehicle. Firefighters recalled Bolden showing up at a station and asking the firefighters to cover themselves with shaving cream so he could depict firefighting in the snow. The Concord Professional Firefighters Local 1045 commissioned him to do a painting of the Great White's Opera House Fire on November 30th, 1920, using Concord firefighters as models. Ironically, Bolden's Loudon home, a stop on the Underground Railroad, was destroyed by fire in 1986. The Concord Professional Firefighters Union Local 1045 also keeps shaken for racial justice as this hall hosts the Overcomers Church for new immigrant communities in Concord. I'm here in front of the state capitol with my Senate colleague, Senator Melanie Levesque. I do want to start by noting that black history is inextricably tied to the political history of the state. From Newmarket, New Hampshire, Wentworth Cheswell was the first person of African descent elected in America to public office in 1777. But it took two centuries for our first state representative to be elected, Henry B. Richardson, in 1974. Well, Melanie, welcome to our tour, and I hope you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experiences in our legislature. Thank you so much, David. Well, I'm Senator Melanie LeBake, and I am the first African-American senator for New Hampshire. My experience has been one of, of awe, actually. I'm in awe that I have an opportunity to work collaboratively with so many people. I often felt almost giddy walking down the hallway, going to our caucuses, thinking I'm going to be sitting with, with educators and doctors and cybersecurity people and great thinkers. 
So it's very exciting to be a part of that. But also, it's, it's primarily very exciting to be able to represent my constituents in my district, as well as the state. I know that you've um, had some particular concerns for African-American history and making that presence felt in this in the state and I wonder if you could talk about Juneteenth and that that certainly. legislation. Certainly um, African-American history is our shared history and several years ago we had celebrated Juneteenth in Nashua and the governor actually wrote a proclamation for the day and I worked with Jordan Thompson who wanted to see Juneteenth be a holiday every year and several others, including yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were able to pass Juneteenth, which is, of course, the day that all men, women, children were free from being enslaved people. And it really brings out the importance of your work on voting rights in New Hampshire, because that Juneteenth was the day when the word finally was brought by federal troops to Texas that indeed the Constitution now recognized people of African descent. But the struggle for the vote continues uh, today. And I, and I know you've taken a lot of leadership on ensuring that people have access to the ballot. Yes, absolutely. The struggle does continue. And as a chair of election law, I feel very responsible for ensuring that everyone has the constitutional right to vote. So making it more accessible, modernizing the process, ensuring that all people have that right to vote, whether they're 18 and in college or, or seniors or disabled citizens, we all deserve that right to vote. And I will continue to fight for that. That desire actually comes from my ancestors, come from our history, to know what it's like to not be able to vote and then to have this right. This precious right is something that we must continue to fight for. And, you know, related to that, in, in the troubled times we're in right now, with the kind of insurgency around Black Lives Matter and the insistence mm -hmm. that there be a, another look at many of the broken and false promises to people of African descent for full inclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, in particular, I know you've responded to concerns about uh, criminal justice and uh, re reforms in that area. And the, you know, how, how, how is it you found ways to work with our police departments and uh, with our criminal justice system to, to, to take a, another look, to make sure that we do have racial justice in New Hampshire? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, those inequities have been going on for over 400 years since slavery began. But even though slaves were set free or enslaved people were set free, it continued. And just in a very um, systemic way and not out in the open. However, um, you know, we, after 200 years of freedom, we're still not free. And this is something that we see on TV nightly when people are killed in front of our eyes, shot in the back. Um, the world is outraged. Our country has really come together, all people. All colors, all ages and stripes have come together saying that, that this is enough and that we want to know more about our history, about our African-American history, about the history of brown people in America. And we want fairness and equity in the law. And this year we passed an omnibus bill that had several components in it that were geared towards police reform. We passed these uh, components with the help of law enforcement. We did it together. And those being banning chokeholds, banning the use of private, privatized prisons, um, reporting police misconduct, and funding psychological testing for new police officers. So again, those things we did together. And that is not the end. This is the beginning. But the important thing is that we continue to do this work collaboratively with the judicial system, with law enforcement, with our advocates and our people that want to see change. Well, thank you, Melanie. It really shows the, the work that, that goes on. I, I think a lot of people, younger people, don't understand that through the 1960s, 
and into the 70s, there was segregation in New Hampshire. There was exclusion from public accommodation, from restaurants, from employment. And, and that generation really fought hard right. to bring these freedoms that people associate with the civil rights movement in the South uh, to, to New Hampshire, which some people used to call the Mississippi of the North. And also, we were the very last state to recognize Martin Luther King. Yes. Uh, Martin Luther King Day. So, in that light, what do you tell these young folks? Uh, you know, young people calling your district who see you, you're a state senator. Um, what do you tell them about what they can do to be involved in, in civic life? Well, I would say that they should get involved in organizations that promote peace and justice. Um, the vigils that we're hearing and seeing around the state, around the country, are very important. It's an opportunity for our young people of color to actually share their experiences with people who would not have heard those experiences before. Uh, I'm very hopeful because it is not only people of color that want to see change, but it's all people that want to see change. So to the young people, we need to embrace that. And yes, that means we may need to teach people. Yes. You know, we may need to educate people, but the thing is they want to be educated. So if we keep going along um, those lines of wanting to know more, wanting equal justice, I believe that we will ultimately obtain that goal. Well, Melanie, you're standing where Frederick Douglass stood for one of his last public speeches in 1892. And I, and I think that your voice adds to what his voice proclaimed to let freedom ring in New Hampshire. My friend, my colleague, how about a distance elbow bump? Ah. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you. On behalf of David Waters and myself, we hope you have enjoyed the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire's Tour of Concord. The Black Heritage Trail Board is committed to expanding the trail statewide, but we need your support. We need researchers, volunteers, board members, and especially donors. We do this in the memory and in honor of African Americans of earlier generations and in the hope that this history can bridge America's racial divisions, foster hard conversations about justice and equity, and affirm for future generations that black lives do indeed matter. Please join us by visiting www.blackheritagetrailnh.org. Thank you, and thank you for your contributions, and thank you for your interest in the trail.